I'm Marty Stauffer. Here in Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell is a famous symbol of freedom. In the same way, the white-tailed deer is a familiar and beloved symbol of the wild. And just as Pennsylvania is typical of what's best about American life, so the story of the whitetail in Pennsylvania shows that some wildlife can thrive in man's world. These deer are found in all of the continental United States, so they're not unique. The ones here are the same subspecies that's found all over the Northeast. But the Keystone State has been especially good for them. At the beginning of the century, hardly a white tail was left in Pennsylvania. Now there are almost a million. But success has two sides. Hunters and wildlife lovers see them as an asset. Farmers and lumber companies see them as a liability. Since almost all their natural predators are gone, without careful management, overpopulation can make them their own worst enemy. This is the story of how a wild creature can live with man. The story of the Pennsylvania whitetail. Pennsylvania, with its rolling hills and farmland, is pretty any time of year. But in autumn, it's spectacular. And when the nights turn frosty, the whitetail, too, reaches the peak of its powers. Naturalist Ernest Thompson Seton proclaimed the whitetail the swiftest keenest, shyest, wisest, most prolific, and most successful of our deer. He also called this graceful creature the American deer. As much as it deserves these superlatives, the whitetail's success must be credited to human as well as to natural factors. the number one big game animal in the United States and has been for centuries. It fed and clothed the Indians long before white settlers arrived. And then it fed and clothed the settlers. In a sense, this deer made possible the very civilization that put it in jeopardy. Ironically, there are probably more deer now than before the white man came. In Pennsylvania's Cook State Forest, one of the last stands of virgin timber remaining in the east, we can see how a towering canopy of primeval trees limits the underbrush that whitetails depend on for food. Once the east was almost solid trees. The croplands and open woodlands that replaced the deep forest are more to the whitetail's advantage. Commercial hunting, above all, 
nearly destroyed the entire whitetail population in the east, and the spread of urban civilization slowed its recovery. That a healthy society must leave room for its wild creatures was recognized early in Pennsylvania, and whitetail numbers have been on the increase since the beginning of the century. Though man has taken over much of the protective role toward wildlife, a doe's instinct toward her fawns is no less strong than it's always been. The black bear is another large mammal that still roams the woods of Eastern America. Primarily a vegetarian rather than a predator, it presents little threat to a healthy doe or her fawns. Only a few short centuries ago, the doe would have had more to contend with. Mountain lions and even jaguars roamed Pennsylvania, along with packs of wolves. Now the only serious predator is man. Yeah, what's that? Looks like something's been rubbing on here. Yeah, and here too. I wonder what it was. Well, I don't know. Quietly, the doe leads her fawns away from danger. As she's taught them, each one finds its own hiding place. This pile of timber looks pretty dry. Yeah, but let's start with that one over the hill that I saw the other day. Oh, we'll have to carry it. A whitetail mother will sometimes teach her offspring to hide by forcing them down with her nose or forefoot. In this case, the fawn has already learned its lesson. The doe knows that one of her fawns is hiding close by, but where's the other one? And is it safe? As reluctant as she is to leave her fawns, her instinct tells her that she must first protect her own life. Hey, what's this over here? The doe cannot know that the woodsmen mean her fawn no harm. Let's go, we don't want to make her nervous. The doe is wise in her caution, but her offspring seem interested only in lunch. Not all fawns are so fortunate. Many are orphaned before they lose their spots. Most often, their mothers are hit by cars. Each year, upwards of 25,000 whitetails are killed on the highways of Pennsylvania. 
and in 1975, the toll reached almost 40,000. Pennsylvania has several rehabilitation centers for orphaned fawns, like this one near State College. Fawns whose mothers have been injured by cars or dogs are raised here until they're strong enough to be turned loose in the wild. Here it is. That's right. Come on. A fawn alone by the roadside may need help, but it's not a good idea to remove a fawn from its hiding place in the woods. The mother is probably very much alive and very close by. Summer is a refreshing time for everybody. The deer have shed their gray-brown winter coats and are now in their reddish-orange summer coats. And the buck's new antlers are covered with tender velvet. One of the whitetail's worst problems is insects. Its thin summer coat affords little protection from the swarms of biting flies, mosquitoes, and midges. It's no wonder that many deer take to the water or stay in the tall grass to find relief from these tiny tormentors. But the weather is mild and food is plentiful, or at least it is where deer herds are not fenced into areas too small to support their numbers. An adult whitetail requires at least 10 or 12 acres on which to browse. This density ensures healthy vegetation and healthy deer. Summer is the season of play and of learning. Already the fawns are beginning to eat what their mother eats. By September, they'll be weaned. And by September, the deer will have grown back their blue-gray, cold-weather coats. The layer of nerves and blood vessels that nourish the buck's growing antlers dries up and begins to itch. In less than a week, the last shreds of velvet will be rubbed away, and the new antlers will be polished and gleaming. This is the season of plenty, when the deer put on weight and hunters scout their quarry. All summer, bucks and does have remained apart, the does with their fawns and the bucks at peace with each other. But as October's leaves turn red and gold, the tempo of life quickens as whitetails prepare to meet in the most important rituals of their lives. Early in the rutting season, confrontations seem almost playful. The bucks spend as much time shadow boxing with saplings and branches as they do with each other. But this kind of play is ultimately serious. With their proud antlers and swollen necks, the bucks are in splendid condition. Most of them are spoiling for a fight and have little trouble finding one. A musky gland on the inside of the hind legs of both bucks and does and a scent gland near the eye of the buck stimulate the action with their provocative odors. A buck with tines on its antlers is called a rack buck. One without is known as a spike buck. The size and shape of a whitetail's antlers has as much to do with diet as with age. For the antlerless doe, 
Her crowning glory is the white flag of her tail. With it, she signals to her fawns and sometimes to potential mates. During early fall, the deer fatten up on corn, apples, and other crops, as well as on woodland plants. One whitetail does little damage, but a small herd can create havoc in a farmer's field or nibble a newly planted forest to the ground. The solution in Pennsylvania, as in most other states, is a controlled hunting season, which coincides with the rutting season. Individual reasons for hunting are many, and it's not the purpose of this program to either denounce or defend sport hunting. From a game management point of view, the purpose of hunting is the removal of a certain percentage of the animals. Some animals die, so the remaining herd is healthy. In 1897, no whitetail at all were observed in the Keystone State. Ten years later, after conservation-minded people had imported them from other places, 200 bucks were taken. From 1915 until 1958, the number of deer killed by hunters each year increased, as did the total number of deer. Currently, there's a harvest of well over 100,000 animals each season. A whitetail's main advantage is not speed, but wariness, stealth, and intimate knowledge of the hiding places in its home territory. Boy, I tell you, that's a nice whack on that get this guy? Oh, about 20 miles south of town. Down Man is sometimes a force unto himself, but even he is subject to nature's laws. Well, yeah, about dawn. Got him. Man hastens nature's process. The deer that die create a place for those that go on living. By November, the fawns are completely weaned, but they'll continue to stay with their mothers throughout their first year. This little button buck is already thriving on acorns. Older bucks have other things on their mind besides food. In fact, they eat very little during the mating season. Instead, they spend a lot of time making scrape marks along their trails and leaving behind scent clues for prospective mates. One of the reasons for the whitetail's prolific success is that bucks reach sexual maturity by age two, and does even earlier while they're still yearlings. Most bucks do not mate until they're in the prime of life, about three or four years old, like this one. The more mature the buck, the more likelihood that he will pass on to his offspring not only his physical characteristics, but the strength and intelligence to survive.
The rut lasts from late October through February. During this period, a doe comes into heat every 28 days for about 30 hours each time. Her odor and attitude reveal whether she's ready to accept the buck. If she's not, he continues his search for a doe that is. One of the most amazing things about whitetails is that, wild as they are, they wander very little. Homebodies, they live their entire lives in an area of less than one square mile. Even if food becomes scarce, they're reluctant to move. Does, as well as bucks, return over and over again to the same scrape marks. Now, at the height of the rut, the watching buck senses that the once reluctant doe is now ready to breed. But the scent of a doe in heat draws other bucks. At this time of year, the deer in a given area have formed a loosely knit herd. A buck following a doe in heat often enters the territory of another buck. Tensions run high as bucks and does are drawn together. tucked under tails and laid back ears give notice that rivalry among these magnificent equals is about to come to blows. Battles go on until one buck is wounded or too exhausted to fight. Some of the does may scatter. The winner is the buck with enough stamina to follow. Compared to the months of preparation and the strenuous fighting that precede it, the courtship ritual is brief.
As a species, whitetails in Pennsylvania may be the most well-observed, thoroughly studied, and carefully managed wild animals in existence, a natural resource to be harvested. But as individuals, each whitetail is still a beautifully wild and untamable creature. Each still lives out its life according to instincts and habits evolved over many centuries. Close association with man may now be the major influence on this deer, but with man's help, it will continue to evolve as our most admired symbol of all wild things. Pennsylvania is a great place, colorful, down home, and all American. Maybe this is because the Keystone State is finding a way to balance its resources so that wild creatures and their habitat are as necessary as industrial development, which seems like a very civilized way of looking at the world to me. As we grow wiser, perhaps we'll learn that all wildlife is valuable. After all, Living free is as important to them as it is to us. And for man as well as for animals, living free means living in harmony with the natural world, as the people of Pennsylvania are learning to do with the Pennsylvania whitetail. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.